Hi, everyone. We're just going to begin in a few minutes. If you can hear me, please just let me know by typing into the chat. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I'm just gonna wait a few more minutes for a few people to trickle in and we'll begin at exactly around seven o'clock. For those of you who have for those of you who have recently joined, we're going to begin in a few minutes and just waiting for a few more people to trickle in. Thank you for your patience. Hey, Mo, it's just, are you in? Yep, hi, Francis. Oh, great, awesome. Oh, good, everyone is uh, gathering. I just sent a reminder. All right, we're just gonna wait for more people, okay? All right, sounds good. Do you need me to email you? I, I mean, you have the file. I could send it to you again if you want. Let me do it again. Oh, I, I have it up. Okay. All right, so we'll just wait.
I think we're good to go, Mo. Let's start on time. Good? Mo, you're uh, just Yeah, unmute. I'm good to go. Yeah. All right, let's get started. So let's just, before we go into the test, let's just go over some logistics really fast. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Do you want to go through it really quickly? Because um, it's just, it's in the email, just what, just some details about the exam. It's what we did last time for a few minutes. Oh, yeah. So let me go ahead and pull up the email. Mm -hmm. So uh, welcome everyone. Good, um, good uh, evening. My name is Mo. I'm one of the tutors here at Queller. So today's session, we're going to be going over the Hunter tests, uh, math section specifically. Um, so just so everyone knows, you know, the test is on June 23rd. There's currently a, um, you know, a course that's going to be starting this Saturday at Queller that's, you know, it's jam packed with, you know, 10 sessions to fully prepare the students as much as we can based off of what we know about the exam and with the limited time that they've given us. Um, it's available to students in person at Queller Queens. It's a wonderful, large, spacious, very clean and, you know, following all CDC guidelines, um, you know, center that takes care of everyone, makes sure that everyone is properly taken care of, masks are there for everyone who needs them, or you can take Zoom classes online as well. Along with the class and the structure that it's set up on, everyone will be getting a few materials. Um, we'll be going over test two today in our session, but they'll be getting this 10 practice test booklet. Um, and it's a book that, you know, um, Francis, like the whole Queller team has put a lot of time behind in making these practice tests to properly reflect what um, is similar to what's on the Hunter sample test so that students won't be caught off guard and be you know, prepping with the right material. There's also the Hunter High School entrance exam. So this book is more so about, it also has sample exams in it, but it's more so about giving students information about the nuances of the exam itself. They'll also be getting a core vocabulary book now, the test doesn't necessarily test vocabulary in every single question in a traditional manner, like what is the definition of this word, but it does so through reading comprehension, the ELA section, which is 50 of the multiple choice out of the 80 that are there. So it's very important that students have a very strong vocabulary, not only to be able to answer the questions about vocabulary, but also to be able to read the passages that are given to them in the test. Um, and this year, the Hunter test scores were based off of their fourth grade um, statewide test scores. And these are the cutoffs, 626 for ELA and 628 for math. Mm, that's about it. I don't really have much else to add. Uh, Francis, do you wanna add anything else? Um, yeah, if you wanted to do the short course, please keep that in mind. Those of you in the longer course are already, you know, in the program, you can share it with your friends and your family. Um, I think we're covering a lot of ground here. I'm just trying to think if there's anything else. I'm looking through it. So just keep in mind that they do have the Hunter cutoffs. If you have any questions for the cutoffs, uh, you know, please keep in mind that, uh, you know, th these are the number information. If anyone wants to type any questions into the chat box, you are able to do that as well. So feel free. Uh, just, you know, just a little tiny detail. You can share this with your friends in the Bronx, or if any of you live in the Bronx, the cutoff is slightly lower. So apparently no one from the Bronx is applying to Hunter and they're really going to try to get, you know, kids from every single borough this year. So please keep in mind that if you do have any Bronx friends or, oh, I'm, I'm assuming we have one in the audience right now. So just keep in mind that we would like to have you here, okay? Um, I, I also, uh, before we start, I also want everyone to just really take a deep breath. Don't think that you're late, you're not behind. And I wanna be extremely clear about this. Most of you received letters a week ago that you qualify. Hunter did not even know if they were giving an exam until three weeks ago. We were not even informed until three weeks ago that there would be a test. So I just want everyone to take a moment. Everyone's in the same boat. Don't worry. We're just going to plan to move ahead. All right. So if you are new to, you know, a test prep program, so on and so forth, you have nothing to worry about. Everyone's in the same level. So we're okay. Let's just move ahead. With that being said, Mo, I'm really looking forward to the webinar and I'm excited about having this um, moment and I'm, I'm, I really am, I, I'm looking forward 
thank you so much, Mo, for always just, you know, rising to the occasion. All right, let's go, guys. Go ahead. Well, you can get started. All right. Uh, thank you for those kind words, Francis. So I'll get ahead. I'll go ahead and get started. I'll start off with a little bit of broad topics about the math in general, um, testing in general, and then the math in general, and then more specifically to question types. So I'm just going to switch over to the document with the actual um, sample test two in it. Um, so the first thing I've noticed already a few questions popping up about like how many right do I need to get a multiple choice. So part of this we've covered a little bit so this is just kind of a refresher and reminder for all of you here. There's 30 math multiple choice and there's 50 uh, ELA multiple choice. Now the way the grading is done to the best of our knowledge is that the ELA is out of 50 raw points and the math is also out of 50 points. Now since there's only 30 it, since there's 50 multiple choice ELA questions, each question is worth one point. But since there's 30 multiple choice math questions, each one is 50 over 30 or about 1.67 points. So math questions are weighed a bit more heavily because there's fewer of them, but they hold the same amount of weight. That's why the math section, just because there's 30 questions, you shouldn't feel any kind of sense, a false sense of security and like, oh, I don't need to get as many right because the reading is a bigger portion of the exam. I hope that's clear to everyone. In terms of how many you need to get right to get your essay read, um, that changes year to year based off the batch of students who are testing. It's usually the top 500 multiple choice scorers. And once that's determined, those are the essays that will be read. Um, so I'm gonna go on to the math section of the exam. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what makes Hunter math specifically not going into the school, right? Like having been a student of Hunter, I know how they do the math in the school, but specifically, it's more so about how they do it on their test and why that's different from what these students have learned in school traditionally. So something like question number 51 is something that everyone's done, you know, um, order of operations. And the first few questions starts, start off that way, right? Um, I would say they're like in, in basketball, the analogy would be doing layup lines to warm up before you actually play the game, right? So they warm you up with a few questions. And of course, these you can easily fall prey to if you're having trouble with computation, if you're not careful, um, you know, multiplying out. I always say don't do the math in your head because at the end of the day, you have to bubble it into Scantron and they don't care whether you did it in your head or you did the workout in paper the long way. They just want to know if you got it right or not. So you're not really impressing anyone by doing out like computation in your head, right? I, it might save you a few seconds, but why risk those seconds um, to make a silly mistake and computational error and then get a question wrong. So I highly suggest, you know, you show your work, you write on the paper, you make sure you do all the arithmetic out and you don't lose any easy points that way. The first uh, question that's very Hunter-esque that I would say is number 54, right? This isn't a question that they would usually ask at, uh, you know, regular school and middle school in sixth grade. So let's take a look at this one. At the bottom of a completed addition problem, with all the digits replaced by letters, every letter represents a single digit and different letters represent different digits. Which digit might the letter T represent? So what's interesting about this problem is that the question says might it represent, right? So that means that there are multiple possibilities, but remember there's only gonna be one right answer here. So one thing I noticed right away is they're telling me to add the same number MH three times to get another two digit number. So that's one thing I realized. So immediately I can translate, and this is something students have usually covered, not in uh, sixth grade, but like in second grade, when you learn how to multiply, right? You learn that a lot of addition is just multiplication, right? That's what multiplication is. But it's about translating that knowledge into a different way. So MH times three is equal to TM. That's what that tells me, right? That's another way of writing the equation out. The second thing is I now have to think for myself a little bit about what are the possibilities for M. So this is the place where it gets a little muddy because students and parents sometimes ask me, so is this like a guess and check kind of problem? Yes and no, because there's an educated amount of guessing you can do. Like for example, I know right away that the letter M cannot represent five. And the reason why I know that is because if it was 50 times three, it would be 150 and that's not a two digit number. Right, So we need to narrow down what are our choices for M. So with that being said, I can say confidently, M could be one or M could be two, 
or m could be three. Does everyone understand that? Good. Now the second part is, well, if m is one of these numbers, right, it has to also end here. I know that it has to be a multiple of three, right? So I think back to whenever I multiply any number by three, what does it end with? So you'll notice that there's a pattern with numbers when they end with three. Three times one is three. Three times, three times two is six. Three times three is nine. Three times four is, and then you'll continue and you'll notice that a pattern is gonna uh, emerge and so forth, right? So three times seven, for example, is 21. So that tells me that all three of these numbers are still possible. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So this is just so I can see whether or not I can narrow down an answer choice. Good. So let me stop here. Now, the other thing is that if m is equal to 3, right, I'm going to look through each possibility now. 1 h times 3 is going to end with a 1 here and a t here. Well, the only way that h can possibly, 3 times h can end with a 1 is if h is equal to 7, right? So then I'll get 17 times 3 is equal to 51. And so t would be equal to 5. Does everyone understand that? If I were going through the other possibilities, I would be caught up by another reason why they wouldn't work. And I'll show you exactly what, that, what I mean by that. So if m was 2, right, 2 times h times 3 is equal to t and 2 here. Well, the only way that this would be possible is if 3 times h would give me something that ends in a 2. Here, h would have to be 4, for example, or h would have to be 8, right? If h is 8, then I have to carry over a 3. So I'm going to show you each possibility here. If h is equal to 4, then I have 24 times 3, it would be 72, and t would be 7. And that's not possible because it's not one of our answer choices. Does everybody see that? <clears throat> if h was equal to 8, 28 times 3, um, that wouldn't work at all because 3 times 8 would give me, for example, 24. And that disrupts the fact that m has to be equal to 2. So this doesn't work for that reason. If m was 3, it would be too big a number. So 3h times 3 ends with a 3 here. The only possibility I can think of is h is equal to 1. And then 31 times 3 would make it 93. And t is equal to 9, which is also not a choice here. So the only answer that's possible is d. <clears throat> now, let me tell you why this is a good strategy to use. If we had just done our first one and we saw that t is equal to 5, we can go ahead and pick it and move on, and we would have been done. The reason I did all of them out is because what if you started on the other end? What if you started m is equal to 3 and you move down to m equals 1, right? Either way, you only had to try out three possibilities. Does everyone understand? Rather than trying out every single number that exists, this is how you should organize the information. Speaking of organization, that's what makes Hunter problems different. They're not looking at you to kind of, you know, brute force the math out or the computation. They want you to actually think about what numbers you're going to use and why you're going to use those numbers. Okay. I'm going to move on to something like question number 56, because this is a question a lot of people can try to brute force, right? But there has to be a faster way to do it. So this question says, when all of the whole numbers between 100 and 350 are written down, how many times does the digit four appear? Right. So this is not asking you for what are the numbers, but they're asking you how many times does it appear? First off, once it says between 100 and 350, that means you don't include 100 and 350. You start counting numbers from 101 and you go until 349. Okay. The second thing is there has to be some form of organization for this to work. So for me personally, what I thought of doing is well, every set of 10 from 101 to 10, uh, 110, for example, uh, I'll do up to 109. I'll keep it within each group of tens, right? There is only one number, right? One number that this works for. 
if I go from 110 to 119, again, there's only one number that it works for. And this trend continues until I get to the 140s, right? Because once I get to 140, for example, right, I'm gonna get one, uh, 124 again in the 120s. From 130 to 139, I'll again get 134. But this is where things change. When I get to the 140s, 140 to 149, the number four appears how many times? It appears 10 times, right, for every single one of these numbers, but it appears twice in 144. So all of these numbers, it appears once. 143, 144 is the one where we have to pay attention because it appears twice there. 146, 147, 148, 149, and that's it. So in total, it appears a total of 11 times here. And I hope at this point, the pattern here has been recognized. So the other thing that Hunter, um, you know, math they're, that they're looking for in their students to be able to do is basic pattern recognition at an advanced level, right? Because these are just like, once I tell you the pattern, it's like, oh, it's so clear, it's there. But to be able to see it on your own is what's difficult and what you have to practice doing on your own. And that's what we, we do in the classes, right? So this, this entire strategy is gonna continue because from 150 to 159, there's gonna be one. 160 to 169, there's gonna be one. 170 to 179, there's gonna be one. 180 to 189, there's gonna be one. And from 190 to 199, there's only gonna be one. So altogether, from 101 to 200, essentially, right, to 199, the number of times that the digit four appears is, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, plus 11, 20 times. And I know that this pattern is going to replicate itself from 200 to 299. So I'm going to get four there another 20 times. Does everyone understand? And now the last bit, which is from 300 to 349, how many times is this going to appear? Well, that's just gonna follow the pattern here in red. So it's gonna appear 15 times here, right? Cause it's one plus one plus one plus one plus 11. So now if I add them all together, 20 plus 20 plus 15, I'll notice that the digit four appeared 55 times. And that brings me to my answer D, right? And this is a lot faster than me writing out 100 to 350, right? So yes, I wrote a lot of stuff down and yes, it took us about two and a half minutes to do this, but I was explaining all of the steps and my methodology of organizing. When you're taking this on the test and you know to follow this route, it takes a lot less time to do so. And you also kind of guarantee yourself getting this question right through this method. So the reason why questions like 54 and 56 are classic hunter questions is because of two reasons. One, you know, for example, they take a basic idea, the idea that adding the same number multiple times is gonna give you multiplication, right? A basic idea that students have learned in elementary school and they ask you to apply it in a way that's a little bit unfamiliar. Right? It's not the way that school has you tested on it in your you know, unit test or anything like that, or it's not going to show up on the statewide test like this. Same thing here, right? You could write out the numbers and it could take you a while, but rather than taking the time to do so, because it's a time test, you have to find the shortcuts and look for patterns. So there were two basic points of um, emphasis for math questions on the Hunter test. It would be these two things. Organization right? Organizing the information into a way that you can see it better and pattern recognition, taking advantage of a pattern you see appear because with a combination of those two things, you can take a problem like number 56, which would take a lot of time to write out and do it quickly because this is a time test. Okay. Let me move on to another example now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pick this problem, for example. Number 60, right? Let's, so the, because this is not a tradition, what you would call a traditional math question. And I think this throws a lot of students off as well. Okay. 
let's agree to call a number nice if it is not divisible by either four or nine. Which of these statements is always true? Okay. So if a nice number is multiplied by five, then the result is nice. We're gonna go back to this in a second. If five is added to a nice number, the result is nice. The sum of two nice numbers is nice. The product of two nice numbers is nice. And if a, if a nice number is multiplied by three, then the result is nice. Okay. So I'm gonna go through each one and I'm gonna to try to explain it to you in a way where you can think about it by picking numbers yourself. A nice number is not divisible by either four or nine. So let's pick a number such as 11, right? The product of two nice numbers is nice. So I just picked 11, right? And then let me pick another one. Let me say, um, let's go with 15, for example. Well, 15 times 11, it's gonna give me 165. And 165 is not divisible by four or nine. So this seems to be true. The thing here to watch out for is it says that it's always true. So you have to kind of pick and choose numbers, right? And I know that this number was always gonna work for me because one of the numbers I picked, 11, is a prime number. So whenever you're picking numbers, right? And this is a strategy now. Whenever you're picking numbers, try to pick numbers that are very basic. They, they, they don't have any special properties to them. So the fact that I picked 11 is not a good idea because it's prime, right? And it can lead you down a false road. So let me give you another example here. Let's say I gave you 12 and 15, right? Oh, well, I can't pick 12 because it's divisible by four. But let's say I gave, um, I don't know, let's go with 21. 21 times 15 is not going to be nice. And the reason why I know that is because another way to write 21 is seven times three. And another way to write 15 is three times five. So when I multiply the numbers, I'm gonna get nine times five times seven. And whatever number this is, I don't really care about the number itself, it's going to be divisible by nine. And since it's gonna be divisible by nine, it is not going to be quote unquote nice. So D is going to be wrong. Does everyone understand? So he, by, by picking numbers that I knew weren't gonna work, I can disprove them. So for these problems, you wanna pick numbers to try to say that answer is wrong. You're right, you're trying to prove it wrong. It says, if five is added to a nice number, the result is nice, right? So let me use another example. Seven is a nice number, but if I add five to it, it becomes 12, which is divisible by four, and it's no longer nice, right? Because the definition of a nice number is that it's not divisible by four or nine. The next one says the sum of two nice numbers is five. Well, five and seven are nice numbers, so I can use that same exact example and prove that it's wrong. E says, if a nice number is multiplied by three, then the result is nice. Well, I can prove that wrong very easily. 15 times three is gonna give me 45. And 45 is divisible by nine, so that's going to be wrong, right? Now, if a nice number is multiplied by five, then the result is nice. Why is that never going to work? Well, if you think about it, a nice number will never have four or nine as its factors. If you multiply it by five, is it still going to have four or five, four or nine as a factor? No, it won't. It doesn't change the fact that four, that four or nine is still not gonna be able to divide by it. That's why it will remain quote unquote nice. And that's why the answer to number 60 has to be A. So this is more so about understanding how factors work, but in a way that's much more in depth than anything that you all have learned in school, right? If I knew, if, for example, since I went to Hunter and I kind of like was taught in that manner, if I see a question like number 60, I don't really bother looking through B, C, D, and E as soon as I read A. Because for me, I know that A is always going to be true because we have been taught, and that's what we, try, we strive to teach our students in their classes, is that if something is not divisible by four or nine, that means that it doesn't have four or nine as a factor. So if you multiply it by five, it still won't be divisible by four or nine, and therefore answer choice A will be right. And by 
having that level of understanding, you're able to do the questions much more quickly as well and save time rather than having to go through every single possible choice and do process of elimination. All right, let me find another one that I think is a really good example. Number 62, for example, it says a magic square is a square where the sum of the entries in any row, column, or diagonal is the same. For the magic square below, the value of A is what? So at the surface level, this seems like a very, very difficult problem, right? But hopefully you all can recognize that this diagonal and this diagonal, right? The one in red and the one in blue have to equal each other in terms of their sum, because that's what it says, right? The sum of the entries in any row, column, or diagonal is the same. So this middle box, we don't know what it is, but it's shared by both, right? And that's the key here. So we can ignore it. Let's call this middle box, well, let's give it the letter K, right? So three X plus three plus the letter K plus A, which is what we're looking for, is equal to two X plus 10 plus the letter K plus X plus seven. Now, since I have K on both sides, even though I don't know what it is, I can subtract it because I'm not changing the fact that these two equations are equal. I'm getting rid of the same thing from both sides. So they're gonna remain equal. Three X plus three plus A is equal to, now let me combine like terms. 2x plus x gives me 3x, and a plus 10 and a plus 7 gives me a plus 17. Next, I can just subtract 3x on both sides, and I'll get 3 plus a is 17. Lastly, if I subtract 3 on both sides, I'll be left with a, which was the variable I was looking for all along, and that's going to be 14, which is going to be my answer. Now, this problem can become very difficult if you don't recognize this diagonal. Why? If you were trying to say, oh, but Mo, this column, right? And this column, the two columns circled in blue have to be equal to each other. I would agree with you. But the issue is that we have no idea what these two boxes are. And that can skew your results either way, right? But since I know that the middle box is shared by both diagonals, I don't need to worry about it because it'll cancel out. So the biggest fear that I've noticed with a lot of sixth graders whenever we deal with algebra is that, is that fear of the unknown, right? It's like, wait, no, I don't know what that letter represents. I don't know what value it is. If you can limit the number of unknowns you have, the easier the problem becomes. So instead of putting two different letters, like I would have had to call this like M and this one N, Instead of doing that, I just had one letter in the middle, K, that we were able to then get rid of very quickly because it was shared on both sides. And that's what made this problem much more easy to handle. Okay. All right, I'm gonna move on to another example now. Uh, let's take a look at number 65 because this is a pattern-based questions. And these are the ones students usually have trouble with. So let's look at number 65. It says, examine the pattern and determine how many more shaded squares than unshaded squares will be in the 100 by 100 square in the sequence shown in the diagram on the right. So my personal strategy for doing problems that call for patterns, all right, patterns and organization go hand in hand, is to make some sort of chart or table to better see the information myself. So I noticed that there are shaded and unshaded ones, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by making a little chart and I'm gonna include shaded, unshaded, and the type of square. So this is square, um, I guess, level. Right, we're starting off with a one by one, then we're gonna go to a two by two, a three by three, and I think the image only gave us up to a four by four. But that should be enough for us to recognize a pattern, right? Next up, I know that I need to count the number of shaded, and the number of unshaded. So shaded, unshaded. And because the question is asking for this, I'm gonna make a column for that as well. The question is asking for how many more shaded? So, so shaded minus unshaded. 
And this pattern should help us find the one for 100 by 100. Okay. So in the one by one box, there is zero shaded, one unshaded. So the answer here is negative one. In the two by two, there is three shaded, one unshaded. So the answer is two. In the three by three box, there are three shaded, one, two, three, four, five, six unshaded, negative three. In the four by four, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten shaded, six unshaded, positive four is the difference. I hope everyone here can see the pattern because of the way I laid it out on the table. Organizing a problem that has a pattern always makes the pattern easier to see. So the pattern I recognized right away is whenever I have an odd square level, like a one by one or a three by three, there's always more unshaded and that's why I get negative one or negative three. I get negative of the square level, right? In a three by three, I get negative three. In a one by one, I get negative one. In a 99 by 99, I would expect the answer to be negative 99. But when I have an even square level, right? Like a two by two or a four by four, it's always gonna be a positive of that square level for the shaded minus unshaded. There's always gonna be more shaded in that one. So I get a two and a four. So with the 100 by 100, I would expect since it's even, there's gonna be more shaded and unshaded. And so my answer is going to be 100 because it's gonna match with the square level. So I never really need to figure out how many shaded there were gonna be or how many unshaded because I just didn't need to do that. That's not what the problem asked. Right. The other big thing I, I would say um, to take away from, especially when it comes to Hunter math, is whenever you notice problems like these, don't try to do too much extra work. What do I mean by that? The problem never asks for how many shaded boxes are in a hundred by hundred square, or how many unshaded boxes are there in a hundred by hundred square. It only asks for shaded minus unshaded. And so that was the column I paid most close attention to. I hope this clears a lot of stuff up for a lot of people and also shows them how to approach these questions so that it's a little bit more, it's a little bit quicker, right? <clears throat> All right, let me move on to the next one. So the answer to 65 is B and let's, let's actually move on to 66 right below. If you have questions, please type them into the chat and we'll get to them afterwards. <coughs> Lena, and, Lena and three of her friends bought just enough food so they could go for a 12 day camping trip. Pete and Jane surprised them by showing up at the start of the trip and asking to join, but they brought no food. By what percent would the time for the, time for the trip shorten if everyone ate their normal daily portions? So for this type of question, right? I think it's best to start off with a number, right? Uh, picking numbers is a, is a math strategy that has worked for years, right? So Lena and three friends. So in the beginning, there were four people. Four people went on a 12 day camping trip. So let's say that four people ate three portions per day. And it's for 12 days. So they bought enough for four times three, 144 portions. Remember that hasn't changed. There's still 144 portions out there. But what's changed is that there's now six people here. And we're trying to figure out, and they're, you know, everyone's still gonna eat three portions per day because it says everyone still ate their normal daily portions. But how many days is the trip now? That's the question here, right? Well, six times three is 18. 18 times unknown is equal to 144. So to divide both sides by 18 now. When I go ahead and divide by 18, I'll get that question mark is equal to um, eight. So that means that there are gonna be eight days 
that the food is going to last them now. Now, what was my final question? By what percent would the time for the trip shorten? That's the key word. It's not asking what percent of the trip it's now going to last, it's how much did it shorten by. So to figure out how much it's shortened by, I have to do 12 minus eight, because four days is how much it's shortened by. Now that I know that the answer is going to be four days, that means that four divided by 12 is going to give me my answer. Because I have to do shorten over the original to get to the answer here. I hope that clarifies things. So now I just have to turn this into a percent. And the answer to four over 12 is equal to one third. And one third as a fraction is a percent is 33 and a third percent. Answer choice C. So once again, this is a different strategy, but it works nonetheless. Choosing a number that's easy to work with and following through with that number and just going step by step. Every single math question on this test, you know, I'm sure people can do them in their heads, right? Mental math is useful, it's good, but there's no reason to risk it, right? That's the key here. Let me move on to the next question. Um, let's go on to number 67. Rory loves chocolate. In one hour, he eats half of any amount of chocolate that he has. His sister, Kara, decided to treat him by giving him a bar of chocolate every hour. How many chocolate bars had Rory eaten at the end of the second hour just before Kara gave him the third chocolate bar? Again, this follows a pattern and is asking you to organize the information. That's what it's begging you to do. So we have to form some sort of chart here, right? So it says that he loves chocolate. In one hour, he eats half of any amount of chocolate that he has. His sister, Kara, decided to treat him by giving him a bar of chocolate every hour. So let's say for the first hour, right? So this is hour zero. He has one bar of chocolate. So one bar of chocolate. And let's move on. So one bar of chocolate gives him, he'll eat half of it in the first hour. And then in the second hour, so in the second bar of chocolate will be in the second hour, right? So he'll eat half, right? Well, I'm gonna organize this a little bit better. We'll talk about how much he's eaten as well as how much is left. So eat and left. So first bar of chocolate, he'll eat half of it and he'll be left with one half. But the second bar of chocolate is added, he'll now have we have to add it on to how much he had left. He'll have one and a half, right? So this is for the first hour. This is what he starts off with. So this is, you could think of this as hour zero. So from one and a half, he's going to eat uh, half of that. So when he gets the second chocolate bar, he's going to have one and a half. So he's gonna eat half of that, which is gonna be three fourths and he'll have three fourths left right? And it says that Carr decided to treat him by giving him a bar of chocolate every hour. How many chocolate bars had Rory eaten at the end of the second hour? So this was hour one. So sorry, hour zero is when he got the first chocolate bar. Between hour zero and before he gets the second one, it's hour one. At the end of the second one, it's hour two. So let's think about how much he's eaten already. He's eaten one half plus three fourths. Now we just have to add fractions. So that's two fourths plus three fourths, which is equal to five over four, one and one fourth. And that's why that's answer choice D. Again, adding fractions, which is what this problem ultimately came down to at the end, is not the hard part. The hard part about this problem is organizing it in a way that's systemic, that's gonna help you figure out, you know, how am I gonna go from step one to step two to step three and so on and so forth. Um, I'd like to take on number 68 because this goes into a part of math that a lot of students aren't familiar with. Um, in the beginning of uh, sixth grade or in the middle of sixth grade, it's usually covered by the end of sixth grade. So one advantage, I guess, to having the test later this year instead of January is in theory, you all should have learned more math from school Right, cover the entirety of the sixth grade curriculum. 
But of course, with the pandemic year, I don't know how true that is, right? So in, 60, in question number 68, the three-dimensional shape in the diagram on the right is a cube. What is the degree measure of angle B, the angle formed by AB and CB? Okay, so let's take a really good look at this image for a second. In a cube, you know that all the sides are the same, right? So A to B is a diagonal of one of the faces, and so is B to C. So that tells you that A to B and C to B are the same exact length, because they're both diagonals of the same square, right? In a cube, all the faces of the squares, right? they're all going to be exactly the same. They're gonna be identical. The geometric word would be congruent, right? Congruent means exactly the same. What would make this problem a lot easier to visualize is if you went ahead and connected A and C. And if you connect A and C, you'll notice that they're exactly the same as AB as well as BC because once again, they're a diagonal of the bottom face, which is another square within the same cube. So now if I have three sides that are exactly the same, what type of triangle is that? It's an equilateral triangle. And that realization, that recognition is what's gonna ultimately help you solve this problem. In a triangle where all three sides are the same, all three angles must also be the same. In order to figure out what each of these angles are going to be equal to, we ask ourselves, what do all the angles add up to in a triangle? Well, in a triangle, all the angles add up to 180 degrees. Now, since they're all going to be the same, I just need to divide by three to figure out how much each angle is going to be individually. So when I divide by three, I'll get 60 degrees which means every single angle, no matter which one they're gonna be asking for, will be equal to 60 degrees. So our answer is going to be C. So let me go through a few things that everyone should one be comfortable with when doing this problem. Basic geometry by sixth grade, you should have learned what an equilateral triangle is and that all the angles inside of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. One. Two, you should know that if all the sides are the same, it means that they're congruent and that should lead you to the conclusion that it's an equilateral triangle. With those two bits of knowledge that you should have already under your belt, the thing that makes this problem harder is they add 3D geometry to it. They put this triangle inside of a cube and they tell you to kind of deal with it, right? So you have to recognize, right? Again, it's that pattern recognition organization that every single face of this cube is going to be a square and that square is gonna be identical on all the sides. So every single square's diagonal is going to be the same and that's ultimately what's gonna lead you down this path to figure out that this is an equilateral triangle and then to figuring out that the angle is 60 degrees, okay? All right, let me look at one more problem. Uh, well, actually we'll do a few more. I think this is a good one, number 71. What fraction of the area of the large rectangle is the area of the shaded region? Multiple ways to do it. Uh, I would just recommend work with the entirety of the image, right? So this is a two by four. So that means that it has an area, the area of the total is equal to eight. The area of the unshaded, right? So I recognize that the unshaded is this part in green. So everything that I'm coloring in is technically unshaded. That's the part we wanna subtract. One thing I noticed is that this triangle has a base of three and a height of one. And we know that the area of this triangle is going to be base times height divided by two. So three times one divided by two is gonna give me 1.5. I also know that this triangle has a height of two and a base of one. So its area is going to be two times one divided by two or just one. So the total area unshaded is just going to be one plus 1.5 or 2.5, which tells me that the area shaded is equal to 
8 minus 2.5 or 5.5. Now let me go back to my question. What fraction of the area of the large rectangle is the area unshaded? Oh, sorry, is the area shaded? So the area shaded is going to be 5.5 over 8. Now, technically, it's not ideal to have a decimal inside of a fraction. So the easiest way to get rid of this decimal, because it ends with a 0.5, is to just double it. Now remember, you don't want to change the actual fraction that you got, because that's the value, that's the answer that's right. So you need to multiply it by 1. And the way to multiply any fraction by 1 is to multiply the denominator and the numerator, both the top and bottom number, by the same factor. So we'll multiply by 2 by 2, which is really our 1. And I'll get 11 over 16, which is the correct answer. So this is a nice problem because it takes, and this is why test makers like it, it takes on multiple concepts, right? One, do you know how to simplify fractions, right? That are, that are kind of unique in the sense that they have a decimal point in them. Do you know how to do basic area Right, of a shape, such as a triangle and a rectangle? Can you keep track of what's shaded and what isn't? And then can you create the fraction, right, or the probability of figuring, of finding the area that's shaded? So the multiple concepts layered in a problem is also what they like, any test maker likes. Not, it's, not, it's not just specific to the Hunter test. It's because it gives the test maker the most bang for their buck, which means that in one question, they can see whether or not a student has knowledge of subjects A, B, and C in math. Okay, uh, let's move on to question number, oh, question number 75 is a good one. So question number 75, the length of the dashed horizontal line segment is 12 inches. Seven squares are constructed as shown in the diagram, four above and three below the horizontal dashed line. What is the length in inches of the continuous solid path from P to Q? This is a really, really good problem. And because a lot of, a lot of people get stumped when they first see it. So let me uh, clear something up. I'm gonna label all of these portions, right? With different letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Right, these are all my portions. I know that the sum of all of them, A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F plus G is equal to 12 inches because that's what the problem says, right? The length of the dashed horizontal line segment is 12 inches. Now, if we go around, right, in the outline, right, in the green, I'm gonna have to zoom in for this to everyone see a little, for them to see this a little bit better. You notice how, since all of these are individualized squares, the problem says so itself, right? Seven squares are constructed as shown in the diagram, four above and three below. Each of these sides must also be the same as the bottom one that I'm dealing with. And that's gonna be true for every single square. So you'll notice that in every single square, we follow the path except for the dashed line. So instead of finding the full perimeter of the square, we're only finding three fourths of it, right? Oh, whoops. So this is going to be E, E, E. This one's going to be F, 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 G, G, and G. I think everyone here knows, who's in sixth grade at least, knows what perimeter is. They know how to find the perimeter of an, of a, of an object. They know that the square has all the sides equal. But to recognize it in this problem is what makes it hard, right? And you know, you sitting there and you, yourself looking at it as a sixth grader, you can ask yourself, yep, I know what a square is, but would you have thought of organizing this problem in this manner? And that's the hard part, right? And that's the thing that's supposed to separate quote unquote a Hunter student, right? What Hunter is looking for versus someone who's not. And so that's how we're trying to prepare you and also kind of, um, you know, reconfigure your brains or give you that insight to look in that manner, right? 
to be aware of, oh wait, this is another possibility to organize. So now the problem becomes quite easy because it's just A plus A plus A, B plus B plus B, C plus C plus C. And you'll notice the pattern is just, it's just three of each of those sections. So my answer is gonna be 3A, 3B, 3C, 3D, 3E, 3F, and 3G, which is just gonna be three times 12 or 36 inches. Answer choice C, right? And so the nice part again about this problem is I didn't need to figure out or find out each individual A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or G portion. I just needed to know exactly what they were asking for. What is the sum of all of those sides together? Okay, if you have a question, please type it into the chat. I'll be more than happy to answer it, all right? Even if I move on to another question, you can just ask me, Mo, can you go back to question 75? I just want to do one more and then I'll, I'll actually, I think because of time, no, we should take questions time. now. So, yeah. yeah, let's start the questions. Is that good? Let's go through the chat. Yeah, please. So, Mo, I think it's really funny if you, I think it's better if you answer this. Someone asked, why is it called Hunter High School? And then why is the word college in there? So can you kind of just give us a little bit of background? Because you know, I just got so used to it. I don't really think about it anymore, but new to the school, yes. I Can you just explain like, what's the deal with the name of the school? So Hunter, um, College High, Hunter College High School is part of a bigger part of uh, something known as Hunter Campus, Hunter College Campus Schools. So that's from CUNY, like CUNY's Hunter College. They're affiliated and they have chartered out a basic high school. And that's what Hunter College Campus Schools is. Within Hunter College campus schools, you have Hunter College Elementary School, which is from kindergarten to sixth grade. Um, yes, there is an admissions process for that. It is also uh, very complicated. Um, yes, there is testing for that as well, um, but that, that's a story on its own. And then there's another window to get into these campus schools, which is in seventh grade through this test in sixth grade. And so they call it Hunter College um, High School instead of middle school is because they don't have a real middle school barrier, right? Since elementary school for them is kindergarten to six, high school starts from seven to 12. Now, another reason why they call it high school is because, and this is something I've seen from going there from seventh grade, a lot of the curriculum in seventh and eighth grade are geared towards a ninth grade curriculum in a traditional high school. So that's why they call it high school from then on. The other caveat is, whereas in all other public schools, uh, public high schools to my knowledge, when you apply to college, your grades start from ninth grade, right? That's what's added onto your transcript. In Hunter, your eighth grade grades also go to college. So that they go on your college transcript. So for better or for worse, you have an extra year of classes there. The second thing is that since we start earlier in seventh grade, by the end of 11th grade, everyone is done with state standards for what's needed for a high school a diploma. And so a lot of students, including myself, senior year, and even some classes in junior year, which is 11th and 12th grade, we would take outside courses at Hunter College, at Columbia. Uh, I took organic chemistry in 12th grade. So those are just like the other opportunities they have in there. And I guess that's the only clarification for the name that I have. Okay, so I see a few more questions. I hope that answered that question. Um, it did. could go through the other questions in the chat. That would be great. Yeah. So I see when it comes to the math section of the Hunter test, what is the type of question students usually have trouble with? I think a lot of the questions that students have trouble with are things like specifically, I would say something like a number 65, because it's not something that they teach at school, right? I think pattern recognition was improperly, like not taught in this, I don't want to say improperly taught or not taught in this manner. Um, in basic like first grade in kindergarten, right? With blocks, we were taught like after a square and a circle, a square and a circle, what comes next, right? And you would just follow that pattern. But that idea of organizing your thoughts down to this manner is not quite the same as they do it in school, right? In the school curriculum, and this goes back to the common core curriculum, which I'm not personally a big fan of, right? Is that they'll show you a systemic way of doing, like for example, arithmetic. And that's like the only way you're supposed to do it. Right? they don't give you that freedom to work with numbers. Um, and like one of the examples I can give you that like, for example, showcase that perfectly is um, there's a math trick for multiplying any two digit number by 11. So for example, if I had the number 23, 
to do mental math, you can multiply it by 11 um, by bringing down the two and the three, and then two plus three is five. So the answer is 253. This is a mental math trick that, you know, the reason why it works is because 23 times 10 is 230 and 23 times one is 23. So when you add it, you see that the middle numbers are the things being added. So in this mental math trick, right, even if I teach it to the students, because of the way Common Core has imbued math within their brains, they'll keep on doing the trick, but only in this fashion. But for a Hunter student or someone that, you know, has more flexibility in the way they, that they see numbers, if I give them something like 15 times 33, they'll notice that, oh, this is the trick with 11, but it's just 15 times three times 11. So it's just 45 times 11, and then I can use the trick again, and I'll get to 495 faster. So like these little mental tricks is kind of like the way I, I was lucky enough to be taught and I kind of like in elementary school. And so that's what I think may helped me on the test when I took it. And I would say these are the things that's hardest for students because the way math is taught in school is so rigid. Whereas the Hunter test really likes people to think creatively within the realm of math laws and like what's fundamental mathematics. That's, I hope that answered the question about what type of question they have the most amount of trouble with. Are there online tests or materials we can use to study in between prep sessions? Well, there are the two sample tests from the Hunter website, and this is like one of them. So we're getting a little bit of a preview, but you know, you wanna save those because you wanna use them for practice tests. And in terms of materials, like Queller has so many materials, I'm sure you can prep for the Hunter test for over a year. Like you could begin at the end of, like at the beginning of fifth grade and continue going and see material that's new to you. Uh, and then there was a specific question for question number 75 from Anya. So uh, for question 75, why can you combine those different numbers if the variables are all different? Well, the thing is that I don't, I, I can't really combine them. I just know based off this fact that whatever they are, they combine to 12, right? I don't know what they are individually. I don't know if one is one or one is 1.5 or one is three fourths. I just know that they add up to 12. So in the other one, again, when I wrote them out, I don't know what they are individually. I just noticed that it's three times the arithmetic sequence or the arithmetic sentence, right? The math sentence I had above. So since it's three times that math sentence is gonna equal three times whatever that math sentence equaled. And that's how I got 36, right? Because the previous one was 12. So three times 12 gave me the 36 that I was looking for. I hope that answered your question. So as we're wrapping up, we just want to say thank you to everyone. Anybody want to see a cute little baby cam? Anyone? Mo. Mo, you see <laughs> the baby more this week. Okay. Um, so we have a Queller Prep newborn. Mo, are you still gonna tutor this baby when he's older? We'll see. All right, guys, ready? <laughs> a very cute little baby. Anyone? It'll it'll lighten the mood. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you for listening. Okay, here we go. Three, two. One. Okay, ready? Hold on. I keep seeing myself, not this little one. Hold on a second, guys. Wait, here we go. Here we go. Hello, it's a little baby cameo. Should I hold it? Yes. Hello. <laughs> you want to see the big baby? This is the big baby. Hello, big baby. Hi, little baby. Is this, are you going to, is Mo going to be your tutor? Is Mo going to be your tutor? Uh-oh. -uh. I think he's meaning, he meant to say yes. He's saying yes. This baby is, who wants to guess how old the baby is? How old is the baby? Anyone? Do you have a math problem? <laughs> Wait, where's the baby screen? Wait, Mo, you got to spotlight me. Oh, yeah. Okay, listen, baby. Okay, ready? Baby, what is two plus two times two minus two? What's two plus two minus two times two plus two plus two minus two? Uh, yeah, that's probably the answer I would get. Baby, what's two plus two times two minus two? What's seven minus seven plus seven minus 77? These are probably the answers I'd be giving right now. Okay. That sounds about right. What is... One fourth plus one fourth minus one fourth plus 44 fourths and a fourth. Nope. Oh, nope. Yeah. Yes, the baby, the baby's gonna learn math. We're gonna get tutors. Ready? Okay, baby, this is the last question. Ready? Ready? Here's the last question. What is 
zero, who can answer this, ready? What is zero minus zero plus zero times zero minus zero? Zero. <gasps> zero. Do, 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 do. <laughs> who can get that right? Oh. Yay, oh. you got it right, that my little math. Jessica. What, baby, say zero minus, what is zero plus zero minus zero times zero divided by zero? Three plus three. What's three plus three minus three? Yeah. Go, baby. One, two, three. Hike. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> We're not getting far, guys. Okay. Ready? Okay, baby. This is the last one. Ready? Yeah, three Ready? Plus three will be six. Ready? Listen, listen. Okay, this is the last thing we're asking the baby. Ready? Baby. What is one half plus one half minus one half? Mm. How much? Three. How much? Three. No. I don't know what to do, Mo. I don't know. Mo, Mo, you better not <laughs> ever like retire from tutoring because this baby needs a tutor. Like <laughs> he doesn't know anything. <laughs> baby, you are two months, one month and a half. Listen to me. This is very important. You need to know math. Ready? What is one plus one minus one? Go. Mommy. If you What's need... one plus one minus one? Mommy. What's one plus one minus one? Come on, baby. This is the last time. I'm giving you one more chance, okay? One plus one minus one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. We'll see. All right. Well, everyone, thank you. I hope you learned something. Let's give Mo a big thank you. Let's give Mo a big thank you. Thank you, Mo. Everyone, let's go off. Give Mo a big, gigantic thank you. He did such a good job. Let's type thank you in the chat. Good. Let's type thank you in the chat, everyone. Mo, you are the bestest, okay? Mo, thank you so much. And something I enjoy doing with my chat. How do you do, ask everyone to unmute? Let me figure this out, hold on. Meeting, setting, Mo, how do I do this? Chat, meeting settings. I wanna, un I wanna ask everyone to unmute. How do I do this? Can you do it on your end? Do you guys hear me? Help. Mo, how do I how do I get everyone to unmute? Hold on. Unmute. Oh, here we go. I figured out. Yeah. Guys, say thank you to Mo. Thank you, Mo. Thank you. Thank you, Mo. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mo. Thank you. 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 Thank one plus one minus one. Mm -hmm. Baby, that is the easiest question. Wait till you see what Hunter's one asking. Plus one, <laughs> one plus one is two. Minus one. One. Yes, baby. And three plus two will be six. Baby, what is one plus one minus one? Three plus two will be six. One plus one. I don't know. The baby doesn't two. like any of these questions, Mo. Thank you very much. <laughs> one Thank zero you. Plus zero. Zero plus zero. We're surrounded. Oh, yeah. Baby, what is zero plus zero? Baby, this is the easiest question. These questions are so simple. Zero plus zero. 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 Wait, do it again. Do it again. Zero. Baby, say zero. 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 Baby, this is. Wait until you're in the sixth grade. Wait till you see some of these questions coming up. By the way, Mo, all I was thinking about when you were going over the chocolate bar question was how this is <laughs> trying to give the brother diabetes. I was like, what is she doing? <laughs> Why is she giving him like a candy bar every hour? Like, what is wrong with his sister? Someone like call ACS. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <it's> <laughs> oh my God. What, where do they make these questions up? Oh, I have yeah. no idea. I have no idea. Yeah, every question is like that. Her brother a candy bar every hour. She must like hate him. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye, everyone. Mo, can you believe everyone? You want to hear something cool? Mo Khan held my children when they were babies. Now they're like big. Hello. Do you miss Goldie, Mo? Look, bye. I do. I do miss them all. Hi, guys. Okay. See you. Come here. Say bye, baby. Mo, you got to see the baby twice in one week. That's a lot. That's a lot of baby time. I know. Hi, baby. <laughs> All right, baby, since you don't know any math questions, you a tutor. So I'm going to wait. You have another, like, I'll give you another, like, month of freedom. You can enjoy being an infant, and then you're getting a tutor. That's it. 
Ready? Yeah, Let the baby one. say zero. Say zero. Zero. Yeah, say one. Yeah, one. 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 All right, Mo, as you can see, the effort is there. Okay. Bye, bye, bye. He's in good hands. He's in good hands. Bye, bye, bye. Michelle, say bye to Mo. Say bye, bye Mo. Bye, Mo. Bye. Wait, I want to say. <laughs>